Need help finding the best earphones? Since 1995, Earphone Solutions has sold high-end earphones to audiophiles seeking top quality and service. Customers have posted more than 2,500 reviews on EarphoneSolutions.com, so you'll find ratings and rankings that will help you make an informed purchase. Please support HeadFi by visiting EarphoneSolutions.com. Hi, I'm Jude from HeadFi.org, and this episode of HeadFi TV is part two of two highlights from Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011. In the last episode, part one, we talked about JH Audio's JH3A rather extensively, but JH Audio wasn't the only one making waves in in-ears. On the custom in-ear side, another manufacturer getting a lot of attention at CanJam at RMAF? Ultimate Ears. Their in-ear reference monitor is of great interest to a lot of audiophiles because of the fact that it's, uh, it was designed to be a neutral, uncolored reference for studio use, and it really is neutral and uncolored. If if neutrality is what you're looking for in audio, I can't think of a headphone I'd recommend over the in-ear reference monitor. Now, if you want neutrality or a more neutral-ish sound, but maybe with a little bit more warmth, uh, a little bit more bloom, then the Westone ES5 uh, would, would probably be a better choice. In fact, it would be a better choice if that's what you're after. Now, it was very interesting at the show because Ultimate Ears and Westone were situated across the aisle from one another, so some people were comparing them one after the other. Um, and the opinions that I got from the few people I talked to that compared them uh, was pretty evenly split. Uh, and it comes down to just what I said. If you want neutrality, uncolored, uh, a flat sort of presentation, and by the way, great imaging with the in-ear uh, reference monitors, one of the best of any of the in-ear monitors I've heard. Uh, this is such a great choice. Um, but again, you want a little bit more bloom, the ES5. They're both $999, so it's going to come down to preference between the two, but that's why you have to come out to CanJam at RMAF. Uh, next time, if you didn't come this time, because it's a great opportunity to compare products like that on the spot. Another in-ear maker getting a lot of attention at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest was Unique Melody. Now, before I go any further, I wanted to thank those guys for coming out because they came out from Australia, halfway around the world, to be with us at Can Jam at RMAF, and it was really awesome to have you guys there. So thanks for coming out. Now, as far as Unique Melody goes, of all the things they had at their table, the one thing I wanted to hear the most I missed, and it was the Merlin. The Merlin, to the best of my knowledge, is a very unique in-ear monitor in that it uses a dynamic driver for the bass and uh, balanced armatures for mids and highs. Uh, now, even though I didn't get to hear it, someone whose opinion I do trust came up to me and thought it sounded really, really fantastic and, and actually said, did you hear the bass on those things in the most favorable light? He meant it, and, and uh, I will definitely hear the bass on those things the next time. The uh, Merlin, by the way, goes for $779. On the universal fit side of in-ear monitors, there were at least a couple models getting a lot of attention. One of them was this, the Phonak Audeo PFE-232. A lot of head fires have been waiting quite some time for this, the new flagship from Audeo. It was worth the wait. These sound absolutely fantastic, and they're one of my two favorite universal fit in-ear monitors currently available. Um, engineered in Switzerland, the sound is precise, but describing the sound precisely <laughs> is very difficult because you can actually change the sound signature to one of three different signatures using a filter system. If you're not familiar with the filter system on the Audeo models, um, go to the URL that you see on the screen right now and you can find out what it's like there. Just know that I use the middle filter setting, which is the gray filter. Now, I said this is one of my two favorite universal fit in-ear monitors. The second of the two is this, the Westone 4. It's been out for a while, but it's very, very popular in the HeadFi community. A lot of people were auditioning this too at CanJam at RMAF, and rightfully so. Um, this has a more neutralish sound signature, very revealing, very resolving. Um, and again, one of my two favorite universal fit in-ear monitors currently available. Price on the uh, Phonak PFE 232s, uh, the Audeo PFE 232s, $599. The Westone 4s go for between uh, 450 and $500, depending on whether you buy the normal Westone 4 or the new one, which is the removable cable version, the Westone 4R. Because so many of us have stopped using spinning discs to listen to music, DACs, or digital to analog converters, have become increasingly important in the HeadFi community, and especially those with USB inputs so that we can use them with our computer rigs. There were a few of note at CanJam at RMAF and RMAF that I wanted to mention, starting with Lavery Engineering's DA11. The reason I wanted to start with the DA11s, I actually have two of these. Yes, in the last couple years, I've purchased two DA11s because I love the DAC that much. Uh, don't let its simple appearance fool you. It's actually very full-featured. Uh, it has the USB inputs, of course, that we're talking about. It also has coaxial input, and its analog output is fully balanced. 
It also comes with a built-in headphone amp section, which is really nice. So if you're looking for a DAC with a built-in headphone amp section, put this at the top of your list because it's very, very good. And I also like the fact that it has a digitally controlled analog step volume control that controls both the headphone output and the, uh, the rear analog outputs. Because if you like me, you use a lot of different headphone amps at varying sensitivities. It's very nice to be able to control the output level. One very unique feature of the DA11 is something called pick or playback image control. It allows you to manipulate the uh, sound stage, the image, left and right. Um, and it happens in the digital domain. And it has very little effect, maybe even no effect uh, uh, in some settings, on, on tonal balance, which is very hard to do with crossfeed. So in a, headphone, in a headphone system, that pick can be used as essentially a variable crossfeed, a digital variable crossfeed. Very well implemented, and that's what I use it for. But if you use this in a speaker rig, you can actually then change the imaging of your speakers. So that's a really cool feature, the playback image control of the DA11. Price for the uh, Lavery DA11, $1,480. Centrance was at the show showing a couple of new DAC models, including a new DAC port model called the DAC port LX. The original DAC port, which is still available, is a DAC about this size, and the DAC port LX is the same size. Um, and in this, in this diminutive chassis, Centrin squeezes in a USB bus powered 2496 USB DAC with a built in Class A headphone amplifier. That's in the original DAC port model. The DAC port LX is for those people who don't need the built in headphone amplifier of the original DAC port, and so it saves you 100 bucks. So the original DAC port is $399.95, and the DAC port LX is $100 less. $299.95. Now, if you're worried about the performance of the DAC being in such a uh, diminutive chassis, uh, you, you don't have to worry about a thing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an extremely well-performing DAC. Stereophile measured the DAC port, I believe it was last year in their magazine, and um, it was among the best measured DACs in terms of jitter performance in the history of their DAC measurements. So again, you don't have to worry about the DAC port's performance, even though it's a tiny little DAC. Centrance also introduced a new DAC Mini model at the show called the DAC Mini PX. The original DAC Mini, also still available, is a 24192 DAC, so it's a little more capable as a DAC than, than the DAC port line, but has a 24192 DAC and a built-in headphone amplifier. And the DAC Mini PX, the new model, adds a speaker amplifier, a Class D 25 watt per channel speaker amp. So it's a really nice all-in-one solution if you want a headphone rig, because again, it has a built-in headphone amp in addition to the DAC. Um, and the speaker amp. So now you have desktop speaker ability and a nice headphone rig as well, all in one box. The DAC Mini PX, the new one, is $1,475. The original DAC Mini, again, still available, called the DAC Mini CX, is $795. In addition to their immensely popular line of headphone amplifiers, Shit Audio is at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest to introduce this, their new DAC, the Bifrost. And like their headphone amps, the Bifrost is American-made, affordable, and it looks really cool. Of course, the most important thing is how it performs, and it sounded great at the show. Now, I was lucky to have them have the Bifrost in a rig with gear that I was familiar with. So they were using the Shit Audio Lear headphone amplifier, which I have, and the Odyssey LCD2 uh, planar magnetic headphones, which I also have. So it was a nice way to evaluate the Bifrost. And it impressed me enough that I ordered one on the spot. Here it is. Um, and I've been playing with it. A really nice DAC. I can't believe the price. Um, it, it checks all the, the buzzword checkboxes off. It has async USB, if you want the USB option. It has a JFET low noise discrete analog output stage. Uh, it uses the AKM 4399 DAC chip, which, goes, uh, which supports 24192. So again, it checks all the, the buzzword checkboxes off. As far as affordability, the price is 349 bucks if you don't need the USB input option. If you do want USB input, and again, it's an async USB implementation, $449. I wanted to take a quick moment at this point just to thank a couple of people very quickly. First, I want to thank Marjorie Baumert, who is the head of RMAF. She had the foresight a few years ago to invite HeadFi to participate at RMAF the way that we do. Um, and, she, and, and through doing that, by inviting us into RMAF, she has done so much to help bring a lot of attention to headphone audio and to further headphone hi-fi. I also want to thank John Pertil, who goes by JFP11801 on the forums. He is the co-organizer with me of Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, and, um, and frankly, I, I don't feel like I could do it without him. So thanks to John as well. This year's Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest was our biggest one so far. More exhibitors than we've ever had, more attendees than we've ever had. Clearly, the event is growing. And it, I felt like it was actually pulling in people from all over the world. 
it, it was just it felt like a really international event. And so that was really cool. I already mentioned that Unique Melody came all the way from Australia. Uh, Addicted to Audio also came from Australia. They didn't exhibit, but it was nice to actually meet with them there. Fostex exhibited, and they came all the way from Japan. Um, uh, Tetsuro Oishi from Skull Candy was there. Again, they didn't exhibit, but Tetsuro, who is the head of engineering and acoustics at, um, at Skull Candy, was there. So it was nice to meet with him again. And then Michael Koss Jr. was there from Koss with a small team. So it was really nice to meet with the Koss team to really talk about some of their legendary products and then also really have a nice discussion about the direction cost is going in. Some of these companies that didn't exhibit may exhibit next year, but regardless, we had such a great time and it was really nice seeing everybody this year. It just felt like such an international, cool community this year. Of course, at Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, you'd expect to see and hear a lot of headphone amplifiers, and there certainly were a lot of headphone amplifiers there. In the desktop headphone amps category, there were a handful of standouts for me, and I wanted to start with this one. It's the Apex Hi-Fi Audio Butte. It was designed by audio legend Pete Millett, and it's distributed by Todd Green, Todd the Vinyl Junkie. I might have walked right by it because it's so unassuming looking, but Todd insisted that I plug the LCD3 I was walking around with into the Butte, and I'm glad I did. Clean and powerful is best I can describe it. Very transparent with the Odyssey LCD3. I ordered one on the spot. It's $495, and to me, for its performance, that's an outstanding bargain. So I ordered one on the spot. I've since used it with the LCD3, the LCD2, and the HE500, three of my favorite planar headphones, and it just sounded fantastic. Sounds fantastic with all three. So I'm glad I picked it up. Can't recommend it enough. Another standout at the show we mentioned in the last episode in part one of our coverage, which is the Ray Samuels Audio Dark Star. It's about $3,000, and I just wanted to mention it again because I think it's the most powerful dedicated headphone amp on the planet, and there's nothing else I'd rather uh, drive the HE6 from Hi-Fi Man with than the Dark Star by Ray Samuels Audio. Again, about $3,000. Eddie Current was there with the balancing act. I've heard this amp on a few other occasions, and I've always been wowed by it. It's one of my dream amps. It's uh, 3950 bucks, so it's, it's on the higher end uh, of the pricing uh, with desktop headphone amps, but it just sounds and looks beautiful. Craig Uthis of uh, Eddie Current is a genius as far as I'm concerned, and this is one of his, the best amps he's ever made. Uh, in terms of its appearance and in terms of its sound. It's the first time I heard it with a planer. It was, I heard it with the Odyssey LCD2, and again, it sounded beautiful. And that's the Eddie Current balancing act. Woo Audio is there with a new flagship, extreme flagship, called the WA234. It's a dual monoblock headphone amp design, and it's really innovative in its appearance. I've never seen a headphone amp that looks like it, and it also uses a chassis made of stacked, I believe it's stacked steel. It, it results in, a, in, in these two chassis that I could barely pick up. They felt like they weighed a ton. Um, they were driving the uh, uh, Sennheiser HD800 with the WA234, and it sounded beautiful. Ex you know, extremely authoritative, beautiful, powerful, and I'd like to spend more time with it. There was a line, so I didn't get to listen to it as long as I'd like, but I love the HD800, and it just sounded awesome through the WA234. It's also innovative in its circuitry, by the way. The WA234 uses this key system. You change the keys, you change the circuit. So you can use three different types of tubes with it, 2A3, 45, or 300B, depending on which keys you have in. So a really cool amp in the WA234. SPL was there with the Phonator. We talked about it in Head TV episode nine, so I'm not gonna go into great detail here only to say that seeing and hearing it again and playing with its crossfeed, which again, I think is the best in the industry, um, made me want one again very badly. Uh, the SPL Phonator goes for about $2,000 and it was a very, very popular headphone amp to audition at CanJam at RMAF this year. Cavalli Audio was there. Cavalli Audio is run by um, Alex Cavalli. He is a DIY legend at HeadFi because he has designed several designs that he's made available for free to the DIY community at HeadFi. And now he has his own company, and I heard the Liquid Fire. This is the first time I heard the production version of it, and it sounded gorgeous with the Odyssey LCD2. This was the amp probably that, that uh, more than any other amp at the show, people were saying I had to try with the LCD2, and I can see why. What a beautiful pairing. Um, I did not hear it with the LCD3. That's something I'll do next time I have a chance to listen to uh, Liquid Fire. Uh, and... Um, uh, oh, it's a DC coupled hybrid design, by the way, the, the liquid fire. Uh, hybrid meaning solid state and tube. I believe it used uh, four 6922 tubes, but what a gorgeous amp. Those are kind of my standout choices. Uh, there were some other amps maybe that I missed at the show because there was so much to hear, but those are my standout choices for desktop amps at CanJam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. If you want 
to, to read even more impressions, make sure you go to the thread that I'll link to in the description of this video, the threads covering Kanjam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest because some of the other people uh, heard some of the other stuff that I missed. Few headphones have altered the high-end headphone landscape single-handedly like the Sennheiser HD800 did when it was released. And I wanted to mention it because at Kanjam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, you saw it everywhere. It was used in a lot of different rigs and it's still one of the best headphones in the world. Uh, again, it uses uh, ring-shaped drivers. I know a lot of you know that already, um, but it's still very unique to it and it is ultra resolving. Just a beautiful headphone. I had to mention it because it was everywhere at Kanjam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest and remains one of my favorite headphones of all time. Like so many head fires, for many years I've enjoyed listening to Biodynamic headphones, but it wasn't until they released the Tesla line, beginning with the T1, that I became a big Biodynamic fan. Now at Kanjam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 2011, the big Biodynamic exhibit was a pretty popular stop because they had a pretty wide breadth of headphones, including the Tesla line. Now these are three of the full-size Teslas, and they actually have something in common, these three big Teslas. They all have livelier than neutral treble, but I like it. It's kind of a flavor of the full-size Tesla so far. And I like the way they do it with all three. It's done without being edgy, and it brings out good treble details. So I, I, I'm enjoying the, the, the Tesla flavor, if you will, so far. Now the T1 is the flagship of the Tesla line. It's the best of the three, in my opinion, of all the Biodynamics headphones. It's competitive, in my opinion, with the Sennheiser HD800, uh, Odyssey's offerings, the Hi-Fi Man planers. Put it in a great desktop rig, and you will get world-class performance out of this headphone. Wonderful piece. The T5P gives a lot of the magic of the T1. It doesn't sound the same, but it does sound of the same family. It's also a closed headphone, whereas the T1 is a semi-open. It has low impedance and a short cable terminated in mini, so clearly Biodynamics is encouraging the use of uh, the T5P with portable, uh, portable setups. I use it directly out of my iPhone and it sounds good. Put it in a portable rig, a good portable rig, it sounds even better. Put it in a really good desktop rig and it scales up really high. Not quite as high as the T1, but really high. The T70 is the, of the three is the one I have the least experience with. It just arrived and I didn't get a chance to really listen to it at the show. So we'll talk more about this going forward. Now the T5P and the T1, $1,300 a piece. The T70, $570. So that's it for our HeadFi TV coverage of the 2011 Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest event. It was such a great event, but there's even more complete coverage in some threads on HeadFi's forums, a lot of photos, great coverage by a lot of members that were there. Make sure to check it out. We'll have links in the description of this video. We'll see you next time.